Okay, so I think we might just um, kick off and we can admit others as they come along. That suits everyone. So, um, first to say hello everyone and welcome to this afternoon's seminar on avoiding a rent emergency after the COVID-19 emergency. Our seminar is hosted by Focus Ireland together with Threshold. My name is Rosemary Hennigan and I'm Policy Coordinator at Focus Ireland and I'll be chairing along with Anne-Marie O'Reilly of Threshold. So we're delighted to have so much interest in today's very timely topic, so thank you all for joining us. Uh, as we all know, the housing and homelessness crisis hasn't gone away during COVID-19 and the private rental market remains one of the main pathways into homelessness. For this reason, we're keen to have this conversation today to kickstart the policy discussion around appropriate supports for renters so we can avoid a further crisis when the current emergency measures are unwound. So I'll introduce our speakers now shortly, but just to say that we'll hold a Q&A at the end of today's presentations, and we're going to use the chat function on Zoom so you can post your questions there as they occur to you throughout the presentations, and then Anne-Marie will put those questions to our speakers during the Q&A. So our speakers today are Dr. Barra Rowntree, an economist at the Eco Economic and Social Research Institute, where his work focuses on income inequality, living standards, taxation, welfare and pensions. Dr. Mary Murphy, who is Senior Lecturer in the Department of Sociology in Maynooth University. And our final speaker is John Mark McCafferty, Chief Executive Threshold. Okay, so Barra, when you're ready, take us away. Sure. Um, let me know if you can see these slides now in one second. Yeah, are you, are you able to see them there in full screen? Yeah, great. Okay, um, so thanks very much, uh, Rosemary, for the invitation along and to yourself and Anne-Marie and the others at, at Focus and Threshold for organising this. Um, I'm going to speak for about 10 minutes, just give you about, about the job losses and where they have uh, fallen, because I think this th th there's some indications that where these job losses are falling is going to be disproportionately on people likely to rent. And that's going to have implications then for, for obviously the, the rental situation in the months ahead. So I think this kind of sets up the context and maybe discussion nicely for the other speakers and great to be um, sharing a, a, a panel with them. Um, so I think really what I want to kind of start by emphasizing is um, just the sheer scale of the, of the job losses. Um, so this figure here just shows the numbers unemployed uh, from the CSO, uh, CSO series back to 1998. And what you can see is through the 2000s, unemployment kind of hovered around at 100,000. Then the, the financial crisis, Great Recession hit. And over the course of about three years, it rose from around that level of 100,000 up to about 350,000. So it took around three years for that, for that large increase to, uh, to occur. Um, it then took us even longer, it took us more than twice that long for uh, unemployment to fall again and to drop back down to its level at the start of this year was again around 100,000 people. But what's really happened then is, is just really dramatic. I think it's important to kind of just appreciate just how this really is like nothing we've ever seen before. So through to the end of March, uh, we had an increase in unemployment um, of the order of this uh, magnitude. So it went up to about 400,000 if you include both the people on the live register and those in receipt of the pandemic unemployment payment or PUP as, as unemployed. So that was, the, that was the case at the end of March. But that, of course, only constitutes about two weeks of the shutdown. Um, since then, the numbers who've lost their job have rocketed. Indeed, by the end of April, we are at a situation like this, where there's about 800,000 people out of work on the pandemic unemployment payment, a job seeker's benefit, um, or the live register otherwise. Uh, and, and then in addition to this, we have uh, more than 400,000 people who are in receipt of the government's temporary wage subsidy scheme, and who would many of them beyond job seekers or the pandemic unemployment payment were, these, were that support not available. So the, the numbers of job losses really do dwarf anything we've seen before. And also in, uh, the, the speed at which this has happened dwarfs that we've seen before. So if I was to bring this series back to the 1980s, it's, it's far worse than then. You know, that, that was maybe a little bit worse in terms of the unemployment rate than, than the peak of the financial crisis. But um, that, that's kind of where we are at the moment in, in terms of the scale of the, of the losses. They've also disproportionately fallen on younger workers. So this is a figure I'm going to show you that's taken from the ESRI's quarterly economic commentary that came out uh, today. And what I'm essentially going to show you is an estimate of the proportion of jobs lost by age. And the way I'm calculating this is just taking the proportion you've claimed for the pandemic unemployment payment and expressing that as a percentage of um, the estimated level of employment back in the final quarter of 2019, so the end of last year. And so what you can see is that um, this shows that about 60% of those who are 18 and 19 in work have lost their job, a little bit less, but 47%, almost half of those aged 20 to 24. Uh, and 
20, 27% of those aged 25 to 34. So really, really stark numbers of young adults, young workers uh, who, who are using, who are losing their jobs. And that proportion is a lot lower for the older age groups. So you can see it's near about a fifth. Um, and so what we really have is that people aged under 34, under 35 even, are, are much more likely to have lost their job. Now, of course, some of these people, particularly in the 18 to 19 year old group, will have been in part-time work or might be living with their parents, but nevertheless, they were in work and many of them, it was their main source of, of income and might be the only source of income in a household. Not, you know, it's not the case that all 18 and 19 year olds live at home, many live on their own. Not, not, not a very large number, but some do, and many of those would be in work. Um, so younger adults have been disproportionately affected by the job losses. And we also know that they're much more likely to live in rented accommodation. So what this figure here is showing is just something I've dug out of the uh, latest available data, the uh, EU Survey of Income and Living Conditions, shows the proportion of workers in each of those age groups who live in rented accommodation. Um, so what you can see there is that you have a slightly different age pattern, but still a very strong age pattern together, where we have about just under 20% of those in work aged 18 and 19 uh, renting privately, much larger for those between the ages of 20 and 44, um, and at its largest at about 42% for those aged 25 to 34. And so remember, we've seen the largest job losses amongst those aged less than 34, and a large proportion uh, of those who are in work rent and rent uh, re privately. And so I think you know, that, that does suggest that we might have legitimate uh, concerns about how this cr jobs crisis is going to affect, um, affect workers, uh, uh, sorry, uh, and, and, and re uh, renters. Um, and I think that might be further uh, uh, heightened by the fact that the job losses have fallen primarily in sectors where we also know that a large number of workers uh, rent. So here, what I'm going to show you is the proportion of workers who rent by their sector of work. Um, and I'm going to color these bars by um, in red if, there's, if, if we think that sector has been particularly hardly hit by job losses. And so this is taken from an estimate by some, some people at the Central Bank and Department of Social Protection and uh, um, Employment Affairs. Um, and so what you can see is that in the accommodation and foods services sector, where we know that job losses have you know, been very, very high, almost 40% of people in that sector work. Um, the same is true in some of the other sectors that have been hard, hard hit. So admin and support services sector, about 28%, retail about 27%. Construction, it's a bit lower, but if you still see all those bars are pretty much in the top half of those, of, of those sectors. And there's lots of workers in those sectors um, as well. So, if we're to take the, just those sectors of coloured in in red there as the sectors are severely affected, there's about 200,000 renters in those sectors taken together. So really is a large number of people who are potentially vulnerable to, um, to, to, to facing problems of, uh, in relation to housing in the coming months if, you know, depending on how supports work out. And I think that's made kind of even more acute by the fact that we know that essentials, primarily housing costs, make a much, much larger share of spending for renters and owner occupiers. So what I'm showing you here is uh, another figure taken from a publication we put out earlier this week, uh, along with Cahill Coffee, Coffee, Karina Dorley and Conor O'Toole. And where essentially we just take total spending uh, for, uh, for households, break them up into private renter, other renter and owner occupier and express the, the, the share of the total spending that's made up of essentials, which is primarily housing, but also uh, groceries and medical expenses, restricted expenditure, which is on things that we can't really do at the moment. Um, so, you know, go to cinema or, or a sporting match, and then other where it's kind of not really clear what way it would be affected by the crisis. But what, what you can see is that renters spend over 40% of their, um, of their total spending on essentials, and most of that is housing costs. Owner occupiers, it's lower around thirty six percent. I should also say that that the, you know housing costs, as defined here in the in the CSO uh, data that this is taken from, also include mortgage capital repayments, which one might think is a little bit of saving as well as being an element of housing costs. So, if anything, that difference is even larger in terms of the essential component of housing costs that you need to make uh, each month. So, really, renters have a much larger share of their spending that is going to be going out and needs to go out in terms of in terms of housing costs and that that are less they're, they're essentially less able to weather any reduction in income that might come about and so so given this i've kind of just given you kind of an overview of just the, the extent of the job losses where they fall and um the exposure of those people to the private rental market and why they're less able to make weather it i think that really creates some real challenges for policymakers. so 
many renters might need support in the coming months. I don't think there'll be a, a large leap from what, what we would have shown you so far. There's around, as I said, 200,000 renters in those sectors that are most severely affected by job losses, but there's more in the other sectors as well. And, you know, the other sectors are experiencing job losses. It's not just in construction and accommodation and food services. There are job losses across the board. They're more severe in those sectors for sure. Um, and so far we know that very few of these have applied for rent supplement. Uh, so this is the, as all of you well know, the, the benefit that is designed for anyone who experiences a change in their living circumstances and who's renting the private rental market and they can no longer afford their rent. So we've seen, you know, about, about a 20% increase in the numbers claiming a rent uh, supplement, but it's, it's very small in the grand scheme of things. It, it's a, it's a three, 4,000 uh, increase uh, off quite a low base. Um, and so that really doesn't seem to be kind of jumping up at the moment. But I think that, uh, that has the potential to change if there are reforms made to the pandemic unemployment payment. So there's been much talk about tailoring it or, or reducing it for certain groups. And so that might have an effect of meaning that more people want to apply for rent supplement if they were able to on 350 euro a week uh, provide for the, rent, the rental costs, but aren't, if that's reduced, then that might lead to an increase in rent supplement. But also we thought during this week, actually, that there was a um, circular apparently went out at the end of March which made some really substantial changes to the rent supplement scheme, made it much more generous, increased the rent limits, rent limits substantially, increased the income disregard substantially, did away with the 30 hours rule by suspension, uh, and also the idea that you needed to have be in that tenancy for six months. So huge changes to rent supplement, but no one knew about these, or as far as I can, I can tell, they weren't publicized at all. Um, and so maybe it's not surprising that more people haven't applied for rent supplement if they didn't know they're eligible. So that might change in the coming weeks, and again, if the pandemic unemployment payment is reduced uh, substantially for certain workers, they might, we might see a rise in rent supplement. And to give you a sense of you know, this, you know, why, why we think this might happen, um, so a colleague of mine, Dorothy Watson and Owen Corrigan from the Department of Housing had a paper in the Economic and Social Review last year where they showed the numbers claiming rent supplement rose from about 60,000 in 2007 to 97,000 uh, in 2011. So you know, quite a large rise, but again, that was for a, um, uh, you know, job losses that have been are, are dwarfed by what we're currently seeing. So, it wouldn't be surprising if we were to see a rise in rent supplement, particularly given the changes that have been made. If people become aware of them, um, so that's going to create. You know, that, that 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 that's one of the issues that's going to be going to be out there in the policy arena. But also, I think there's a real challenge for well, how should we best provide the support? So, you know, rent supplement has many issues with it. Um, one of them is something that's been picked up by many that it creates a strong disincentive to work more than thirty hours a week because you lose any residual payment to rent supplement if you exceed 30 hours. That's regularly, they seem to have suspended that rule, but whether that rule is suspended in the future is not something um, that's clear at the moment. Um, and now that's something that HAP quite rightly addressed. And this may, um, is something we, in work I've done before, we've drawn attention to how it was you know, a good thing that HAP got rid of that 30 hours rule. It has some other issues, many other issues, but that was one thing that it did sensibly. But there, there, you know, this mightn't be much of an issue at the moment when there's not much work for people to go back to or people to look for, but it has the potential and it does create a dilemma for policymakers into the future in that this scheme, if people move on to it at the moment, and it might indicate one reason why their policymakers are perhaps not so willing to publicise the scheme, is that given its current design, it's going, it, it may prevent or may inhibit, um, is better to put it, some of the recovery into the future. So that's something that needs to be looked at if we are going to use rent supplement as, as a way of providing support, need, much needed support uh, to people with housing costs. Um, but there's also issues with HAP. Um, again, you, you know better than, than any of, uh, many of you know better than me, me the, the, the issues with this, but one of the things that I think doesn't get discussed half enough is the huge differences in the generosity of the scheme across local authorities. So the example I, I've used before um, is if you have a, a one earner couple with two kids and they find a house available for the maximum uh, allowed under HAP before the flexibility is applied, so um, 1,275 or so in, in most of the Dublin local authorities, the support that they get will differ hugely between local authorities. So that example family would pay about 270 um, per month in a contribution in, in South Dublin County Council they pay about 350 in Dublin City Council. And if they're just across the border into Wicklow, um, in Brea Greystone, say, they would end up paying about 450 a month. So there's huge differences in the generosity of that scheme. And this is for a house that has the same market rent. So, you know, it, it shouldn't be because a property in, in 
um, Dublin City is more desirable than one in, in, in Wicklow. The, these are houses that would rent for the same amount, but that we give very, very different levels of support to, um, uh, to, to, to families in different areas. And so that's a, one of the, I think, an issue with HAP that is going to become more and more pressing in, in that, as more and more people move on to it. And you know, the, the people might rightly ask, well, why is someone across the road, 500 metres down the road, getting far more support or far more uh, th than I am? And so I think that's something that might need to be dealt with. And then combined with the issues that there are with rent supplement, combined with the fact that we have now at least four major schemes for providing support for housing costs between rent supplement, HAP, uh, the, the, the rental accommodation scheme, and also local authority housing, is there, you know, in the longer run, there's going to be a real need to consolidate these disparate supports, I think. There, there's many of these are claimed and treat families in similar circumstances very differently. And that's something which we've kind of shied away from addressing in, in recent years, but it is going to be, I think, a more acute challenge for policymakers in the years ahead, in that there might, may well end up being far more houses, far more households in, in support, uh, in receipt of housing uh, supports. So that's where I'll finish up and hopefully that's kind of give it, um, sets up some of the, um, some questions for discussion later on and also some of the other speakers. And thanks very much again, uh, Rosemary Amory, for inviting me along. Hiya, Mary Murphy is my name. I'm um, in Maynooth University and I'm taking up the story from Barr there and I think I'll be fairly consistent with and maybe exploring some of the policy options and, and drawing out some of the different implications. Um, what I wanted to have a look at was just the pre-COVID policy and the COVID changes, the number of COVID claimants on, on REN supplement in particular, some issues arising and some recommendations and, and maybe look at some of the bigger picture at the end. Um, but just, Barra mentioned all these, but just to set some context, I suppose we're talking about the state supports for people who are in private rental accommodation. And no matter which one we're looking at, they are all problematic in relation to the rent limits that they set relative to what the market rent is at the moment. Now that market rent is, is likely to shift over the next year or so. So there may be issues there, but I just wanted to say in the round that there are problems with all of these in relation to the degree to which they're adequate. Uh, for the, the cover of the private rent that people are paying. So the issues of top-ups is quite important and I know John Mark would probably take that up. But just setting in context rent supplement, it was introduced in 1997 as a short-term income support for those unable to provide for their private rental costs from their own resources and with no other available accommodation. Um, the scheme was reviewed very significantly in 2007 and the rules that now pertain to this scheme are those that were set in 2007. They've never been particularly increased. The scheme was reviewed a lot again in 2014 in the context of the housing assistance payment being introduced, but really it didn't change a lot of the rules. So as Barra said, it's got a lot of problems in that it, doesn't allow, it only allows people to work less than 30 hours. It allows people to earn 75 euro before their income starts being assessed against the rental income that they can get. Um, and that means that there are fairly significant work disincentives built into the scheme. And um, so it's really for people who have lost the income support that they have from employment quite suddenly, and it's to enable them to keep their private rented accommodation until they find full-time work again and the assumption is that they will leave it completely as they move back into full-time work and we know that that's relatively problematic. The other scheme, the rental accommodation scheme, was introduced in 2001 and this was to get around the fact that a lot, a lot of people who are on rent supplement um, in and around that time period were actually in long-term need of social housing and the rent supplement was beginning to cover a long-term housing need instead of the short-term need that it was designed for. So the rental accommodation scheme, for example, allowed people to work more than 30 hours and still be entitled to the rent supplement as long as they were in theory entitled to be um, housed under the, the rental accommodation scheme. So it was an attempt to fix some of the problems in relation to rent supplement, but it was only ever a temporary stopgap. And in 2014, we had the housing 
assistance payment, which was a fuller kind of policy response, a social housing support for those with long-term housing need administered by the local authority and using the local authority's differential rent scheme, which is better in terms of enabling people to be in full-time employment and still get the private rental housing support um, in the context of inadequate income to cover their rent. So it's much nearer where it needs to be, although as Barra said, it is fairly significantly problematic in terms of the amount of rent it offers, its different operation across different local authorities, and indeed 34 different differential rent schemes across those authorities as well. So it's not without its problems, but it's a lot better than rent supplement when we look at the immediate problem of people being able to move back into employment, having been on a short term uh, private rental support. So one of the big problems, and I just want to name it here and, and not go back to it, is that Although the housing assistance payment is much better than rent supplement from the point of view of providing a private rental income support for those who are in full-time employment, I do want to critique it in that it has become the primary mechanism for delivering on social housing or public housing in Ireland. And that, that I think you can, you can complement it for its strong features of enabling people be in private rented accommodation and get some support for long-term housing need in that private rented accommodation. You can still critique it in its bigger policy context for being part of an overall focus of resolving social housing through the private rental market. So I just want to say that and we'll go back to it again. Now the plan is that anybody who's on rent supplement over the last 10 years or so, who has a long-term housing need will move from rent supplement to housing assistance payment. And we can see in this slide that there has indeed been a relatively steady move of people from rent supplement over to the housing assistance payment. And that is, is a good thing. These people have a long-term housing need. It would have been better had they got a public, sec a public house, but they're, they're, they're moving from rent supplement and they can at least move into employment more easily whilst they're on the, the housing assistance payment. So because of that, what we see in the evolution of private rental supports in Ireland, if we look at rent supplement in the first column, in 2009 we saw 93,000 households on it, and that had dropped by 2020, sorry there's a typo at the end there, it's estimated that last year there were only 15,000 on rent supplement. RAS about 18,000, and the housing assistance payment, we see it increase very significantly since it was introduced. 2016 there was 16,000 buyers by 2020 there was around or 2019 there was around 48,000 dollars so we can see that shift that policy intent to move from an over dependence on rent supplement and it's all its problems to um, make HAP the primary mechanism and I'm arguing that that's that's probably a good thing in the round um, and that causes that drop in rent supplement and a drop in the cost of the rent supplement very significantly. What we see up to 2019 is, is a very marked decrease um, and only 15,000 on the rent supplement last year. But by May 23rd, so by last week, we see maybe an increase of around 5,500 people on rent supplement. And that seems to be entirely a COVID impact in that the rent supplement was declining even in January and February of this year as more and more people moved into the housing assistance payment. So there's been about 5,300, I think, at, as a direct result of the COVID payment. Now, I just want to say one thing before I move into looking at those people a little bit more, because as Barra rightly said, the scale of the COVID-related job loss is very, very significant. We see from the pandemic on, pandemic on employment repayment and the temporary work subsidy, as well as those on the live register, about 1.2 million working age people now depending on some sort of state income. But if you add in those people who are working age but who are not on the live register, lone parents, people with disabilities, people on carers allowance, we see an additional 550,000 people depending on state income whilst of working age. So we're talking about 1.8 million people who are now depending on state income support. Um, and, and a lot of those extra people that we don't normally bring into the conversation who aren't on an employment related income support, they are often living with people who are on an employment one. And they're very important in understanding what the problem is because these people have employment traps and poverty traps 
in their lives as well. And I think it's very important to include them in the picture when we're trying to understand what the scale of the problem is and what the potential range of policy solutions are. So going, just continuing on with, 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 with Barra's story, because he, he showed us the range of people who are in private rental sectors in relatively low paid uh, sectors of the economy. Um, the Department of Social Protection in some work that they released um, earlier this month also showed that they have fairly high levels of debt. Now, sometimes the, the actual amount of the debt isn't very significant, but the amount of people with debt is significant and the debt is high relative to their own ability to re repay that debt. So the vulnerability of this population of people who find themselves unemployed for the first time, but coming from very low wages and already struggling in employment to pay debt, to pay rent, to pay utility bills, and particularly for lone parents is significant. So it's important to remember that when we talk about who these people are who are finding themselves newly unemployed. And I think the other thing to remember is who they are. They tend to be young, as Barra said, but they also tend to be fairly populated by a high percentage of migrants and a high percentage of women. And migrants in particular may be very um, outside of the normal information circuits that are available when it comes to access and state supports. So whilst there's a general information deficit in relation to the changes that the wear and supplement for a very significant proportion of the people we're talking about, there may be additional barriers, fears, issues about documentation, et cetera, et cetera, that make it, make it particularly problematic trying to open up these supports to them. Barra mentioned the degree of changes that there were in the COVID rent supplement um, relative to the pre-COVID rent supplement. And indeed, I mean, it, it's quite remarkable. It's impressive in, in some regards, the urgency and the level of changes that were made, although one makes one a little bit suspicious as well as to why the, the feeling was that you had to absolutely change the rent supplement to make it workable for this new group of people who had suddenly lost their jobs. Um, but thinking that maybe you can go back to it then for people who are who are just the, 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 the general uh, population who might need to so the 30-hour rule has been completely disregarded for the front second adult in the household. The income threshold, PRSI and travel expenses are no long, longer nominal. There, there's a, a cart of 100 euro. Cap Capital assessment has been disregarded, the maximum rent assessment, six months work suspended, and there's a relaxation of the administrative requirement address or your employer's uh, details. So it's been a very, very significant shift um, in terms of what's available to people and uh, the ease of access to the scheme. And it's all the more surprising, therefore, to some degree, that we've only seen 5,379 COVID-related claimants because the degree of relaxation of the rules has been very significant. Um, and we can speculate about why that is, and I, I'm guessing information is one of the key reasons. There's a couple of interesting things about who those 537 people are. Um, there's much more males than females, for example, which is sort of one might wonder why. There's 2,199 are men and 1,176 are women. And within those ages, a lot more younger women and a lot more older men have been part of the COVID um, new applicants. I'm speculating myself, although I've, I've no data to show this, that maybe some of the predominance of women under 40, maybe about lone parents, and maybe the dominance of men over 40, maybe that a lot of the women who have lost their jobs maybe the second earners in a kind of male breadwinner household and that there, you know, that, that that's what's going on. But we don't know, but it, it is interesting to try and see what's happening. So in, in a way, not as many people coming through into the rent supplement in the context of the degree and the scale of the changes to the COVID rent supplement. So, so is there a problem then, I suppose we might ask, you know, or what is the problem? Um, so we know that there's problems and that the level of the rent caps are still very low relative to real market rents. We don't know the degree of 
we know that most people who did apply for the covert rent supplement payment got it but we know a couple of thousand didn't and we don't know why and who they were we don't know about the administrative system and the speed of decision making whether it's consistent regionally we know a lot of work was done to reduce administrative barriers the form was reduced from 25 to 5 pages we don't know about landlord compliance information barriers digital issues and really most importantly we don't know how many people know about it and that that's really important so we can assume that there's lower take up than had been anticipated and we may ask but well, where are the people who we thought might have taken up this this covid rent supplement we know that some and particularly some young renters in particular may have gone back to parental homes but that's limited to the degree they could do that because they had contractual arrangements with landlords and tenancy agreements so we know that they probably couldn't all do that we know a significant number are probably paying the rent that they did pay when they were in low paid employment because the pandemic payment or the temporary work subsidy is probably giving them a relatively similar income to what they got in their earned income and particularly for migrants they may well be just sucking it up and paying their rent from their PUP or their uh, temporary work subsidy. We know and we may speculate that some are simply going into arrears and are in a holding position as long as the moratorium is in place but we might expect an arrears situation to arise and a debt situation to arise uh, for them once the moratorium is up um, and we know now that the economy is beginning to open up that we will begin to see unemployment traps emerging as people try and leave a combined income of pandemic unemployment payment and rent supplement or a temporary work subsidy and rent payment. We know that this is likely to be a problem. Um, so what, what are the issues for employment then if we see the return to normal? And um, so if we see the, the COVID rent supplement collapsed and the normal rent supplement rules pertaining, well, we know immediately that claimants who are trying to move back into full-time employment will be stuck. They won't be able to do that. Uh, we know that the type of income disregard will shift from 350 to 201. So there'll be a very significant shift in how people's income is assessed. Um, and we know that that will cause employment traps. Um, I don't want to get into the difficulty of trying to, it's complicated the way that they um, assess it. I did a rough back of the envelope uh, thing with, with Josephine, assuming she's paying rent of 600 a month or 150 a week and that she had a gross income of 450 from her employment. And I was thinking if she returned to her old job, her combined loss of pandemic payment and rent supplement would be about 105. And if she returns, if she stays in um, unemployed and moves back to a JSA rent supplement scenario, she might lose 150. So these are very significant losses from people's weekly incomes, very sudden as well if they happen. So we, we do have a problem. We don't know if it's a problem for 5,000 people or for 50,000 people, but we know that there is a problem there. Sorry. And, and one option that we might have to just very simply solve that problem, and, and I think Barrow was pushing it out in this direction a little bit, was to simply collapse the rent supplement system into the differential rent system that's used for the housing assistance payment. That's a relatively expensive system. It's complex across the number of local authorities and the number of differ differential rent systems that there are. So there's an immediate problem as, as well, which differential rent system, some are a lot better than others. But it's also shifting from the policy direction that we were going in nationally and that was working quite well, which was to really restrict rent supplement to a very narrow policy function of short-term income support. Um, so if you shift it to a differential rent system, you're opening up a whole Pandora's box of possible unintended policy consequences that we haven't had an opportunity to think through. Now, I'm, I'm normally a big bang, bang solution kind of person and, I, and I, I can see the benefit of this, but I'm going to rule it out and just offer some other ones as an option B, which is to keep rent supplement as a short term option, not to distort the planned policy journey of shifting as many people as possible who have long term housing needs from rent supplement into the housing assistance payment. But to assume that what we see with the housing dynamics in the private rental market opening up, that there will actually be an opportunity to complete the journey 
for moving those who need long-term housing from rent supplement into housing assistance payment and that that will decrease even more the numbers of people that we have on rent supplement and that our challenge then is a to make sure it's adequate so that people aren't paying top-ups when they're on rent supplement and that's leaving them vulnerable to poverty in work poverty or otherwise but our other challenge is to make sure that the earned income assessment in rent supplement is actually employment friendly and that we avoid in work poverty for those who have short-term housing needs on rent supplement. So I think that means looking at the income disregard of 201 euro and increasing it very, very significantly to a living wage level or a minimum essential living standard level, according to the house size, and also tapering it so that there aren't full-time employment traps in rent supplement. That means amending the 30 hour rule as well to allow a tapered return to full-time work. That rule's already there in the rental accommodation scheme. So in principle, it's not mad. You know, in principle, policymakers have recognized that it, it could happen. And I think the other thing that I would try and do is investigate maybe about individualizing a payment. I think there probably are a lot of hidden uh, unemployment traps for the second earners in the system. Um, and, and women will be particularly come across this. So I, I think we need to look at that situation where there are two adults in the household and trying to individualize the rent supplement in the context of that household. I think there are ways and means of doing that. It's not, it is complicated, but it could be done. Um, so instead of moving rent supplement into differential rent, I'm thinking that it, it may actually make more sense in the medium term anyway, to, to keep it as it is more or less, to move as many people who really should be in HAP into HAP as quickly and effectively as possible and to iron out the employment traps in rent supplement as they presently are. So I'll, I'll leave it with that for now. Okay, thank you. Hi all, uh, my name is John Martin McCafferty. Um, I'm CEO with uh, Threshold. Um, so um, I'm gonna present um, the experience of, of Threshold callers and uh, I guess I'll talk about the profile of the callers. Um, I want to thank just Anne-Marie Anne O'Reilly for uh, the collation of, of a lot of this information and for the staff for the, the recording of the data during the course of the service work. So, um, you know, we'll look at the issues for tenants impacted by COVID-19 measures, which there was around just under 4,000 cases. I'll look at rent arrears, obviously, their causes and extent, the challenges arising in the future and possible policy solutions. So the information uh, today has been presented in two stages. You'll see from the, the bar charts, there's kind of two, a light green and a darker green. So the initial stage is from just prior to when the COVID um, health measures were put in place until just after Easter. So that's from the 1st of March until the 17th of April. And then the second stage, which could be described as the, if you like, the bedding down period of the measures from about the 18th of April until the 15th of, of May. So let's just go to slide two and the, the profile of the callers. So first uh, calls from tenants impacted by this kind of new era came in at the start of March before the, the public health measures came in, including um, initially licensees who had been asked to leave their accommodation due to fears by homeowners in a rent -a room scenario. And then as the measures started to come in, they were followed by people working or with businesses in the hospitality sector who had lost most, if not all, of their income due to the measures. And then students when colleges closed and followed by those whose jobs disappeared overnight when businesses shut down. I think it's important to note that those calling is, um, are predominantly younger single people living in house shares. And 69% of those calling has reported losing their home as a result of COVID-19 measures. So just then moving to um, slide three there in terms of the issues, there are, um, I guess, among those main issues by renters Im impacted, um, first of all, in relation to paying the rent and tenants asking us, you know, how am I gonna pay my rent? Making sure the rent was paid and, their, and the home was secure, you know, obviously it's the most pressing issue from our perspective, from their perspective. Um, especially as we're all being told to stay at home, um, rightly. And many didn't know about rent supplement, so that echoes what Barra and Mary have already said, or that they could apply for it. 
and the threshold advisors have been assisting these tenants to secure the payment and in the vast majority of the cases that we are aware of it has been paid without delay and, and can often cover the full rent. I guess some of the other issues there in terms of uh, uh, tenants moving out and those seeking advice on their lease and the return of a deposit wants to know how they could legally end their tenancies and whether they could get back their deposits um, as they were returning home, often to their, their family where they could. And the, I suppose while that was an issue for students and particularly in mid-March, many young people having lost jobs also moved home where they had that option. So that leaves a problem for the remaining tenants who are now liable for the entire rent. For example, if two tenants leave were four once rented a house share, the rent for the remaining tenants immediately doubles as the, re the remaining tenants are liable for the, for the full rent. So um, I think it's important that we compare to the issues pre this kind of COVID phase. So in slide four, uh, these issues are, I guess, in strong contrast to those raised by tenants in, say, February 2020 uh, coming to, to threshold. So as you can see in February, the issues were very much the perennial ones facing tenants in the rental sector. Um, the notice of termination from the landlord being dominant, then uh, rent increase issues, standards and repairs issues, which are kind of, a, it's a common gar commoner garden one, and advice on rights and deposit retention in the fifth. So we had six queries about rent supplement in February, just to put it in context, whereas we had 340 from between the 1st of March to the 15th of May. So a, a marked contrast there. Uh, so in all of these presentations, there, there are very significant contrasts being noted. So in terms of rent arrears and the increase in these, um, this became a much greater issue, obviously for tenants from March onwards. And 12% of the COVID related queries in the first stage uh, were, were rent arrear related, that's 122 cases, that's four times higher than the non-COVID cases in the same age, same time. Compare that to 3% of queries in February um, and 9% um, of COVID related queries in the second stage being related to arrears. And as the graph shows, considerably higher than the preceding months and year. So in terms of arrears by household type, um, I think it's important to note that rent arrears are disproportionately affecting couples and families, with one parent families in particular in the second stage. And one parent families may have found the rent arrears accrued maybe where uh, maintenance payments stopped when the other parent lost their job. Um, so that comes with a, a slight proviso, I must say, in that um, students and single people um, moved home where they could, so rent arrears did not accumulate for them in the same way that it did for other households. So there's a slight skewing, we believe, of those figures. And in addition, where everyone has remained in a house share um, and all are receiving the pandemic unemployment payment, they may be able to pay the rent out of the 350 a week, albeit not leaving them with much. So what's caused these rent arrears? I suppose, unsurprisingly, job loss, reduced income, um, were the main causes. Um, the causes of rent arrears in the month of February have been listed uh, for comparison, as you can see there. And in February, the loss of employment barely factored in causing arrears, whereas it is accounting for arrears in over half of households impacted by COVID-19. And in the first few weeks, the rent arrears reported ranged from as little as €50 Euro to as high as nearly €3,000, there, two hundred two thousand eight hundred. All of these uh, kind of, all of the people reporting arrears stated that they were in arrears of one month. And I guess in the second stage, the arrears reported uh, ranged up to 2,300. And tenants were um, in arrears of up to th three months. So in those scenarios, some were trying to negotiate lower rents, uh, some were offering to pay a proportion of the rent, um, and some were uh, unfortunately too scared to ring the landlord so um, clearly that, that power dynamic prevails although things obviously are shifting with the, the rapidly uh, shifting situation. 
with regard to kind of challenges, I guess, and, and, and future difficulties, while the Department of Employment Affairs and Social Protection has been quick to process payments and pay rents over the caps, there are indeed challenges and issues on the horizon where arrears have already accumulated or will accumulate uh, in the future. So um, I guess in relation to those, those challenges, um, one, um, and I think this has uh, been noted um, by Barra and Mary, renters don't know about rent supplement. Um, they have not applied for it. Um, they don't know if they can apply for it. A significant proportion don't know that they can apply for it. And they're getting into debt and their homes are being put at risk unnecessarily. And I suppose that, that is kind of an ongoing um, observation from ourselves and Threshold about the need to promote services and supports where they're, where they're relevant, whether they're ours or indeed um, the rent supplement support. Um, so that, that's very kind of apparent, I think, this afternoon. I suppose also rent supplement is paid in their ears, so um, rent is paid obviously in advance and once a month rent arrears has been accrued, uh, rent supplement will not cover it. So for those tenants who had rent arrears in March and have now been awarded rent supplement, they likely still have those um, rent arrears. I guess the third one is the rent, the end, the possible end of the rent supplement flexibility. So the department have given a level of flexibility in assessing and processing payments, including paying up to 50% over the rent supplement limit. But this level of flexibility and payment will come to an end. Uh, the department's circular states that these measures are in place until the 31st of May, three days time, after which the normal rules will apply unless there's some kind of extension. And if um, it's not extended, there's a real risk that the department will review the rent supplement payments downward and direct tenants to negotiate with their landlord. And where a landlord will not reduce the rent, the tenant is likely to accrue rent arrears or enter financial difficulty. And while DAFT has reported recently that there was a small drop in rents from March to April this year, tenants will need to, uh, will, they'll need their rents, I guess, reduced by 20, 30% or more, um, and not a mere 2% to anywhere close to, to come anywhere close to the, the rent supplement limits. And we saw this before when rent supplement limits were reduced downward in 2013 and tenants were directed to negotiate with their landlords. In the following year, we set up the uh, a thing called the Interim Tenancy Sustainment Protocol um, to support those tenants at risk of losing their home where the rent surpassed the, the rent supplement limit. I guess the fourth factor is continuing unemployment. and uh, This has been highlighted by previous speakers. So there's a um, strong possibility that many who lost their jobs will not be returning to work for the foreseeable future and so are likely to be in need of rent supplement or an equivalent for some time. And in time, they may need to be uh, directed to, or they might be transferred to HAP. And obviously the HAP of offices operate with less, less, less flexibility even when calculating the, the level of rent to be paid. And we're already aware that a sizable cohort of the housing assistance payment tenants pay unaffordable top ups. I guess a fifth factor is that rents are unlikely to decrease significantly. And um, I, I think that's a debatable one, but um, it's not absolutely inevitable that rents will reduce right across uh, the market in uh, a very significant way. So they may decrease, but it's unlikely we will see the reductions required to, to make the rental sector truly affordable uh, for some time. And at current levels, HAP or rent supplement are insufficient and many more may find themselves paying some form of top up. I guess in terms of the reduction in the pandemic unemployment payment, as stated by the other presenters, again, when the PUP payment is reduced, those who are currently pay, paying their rent from it will need to apply for rent supplement and where they're unaware of their eligibility or there are delays in applying arrears will indeed accrue and this will be exacerbated if the old rules of rent supplement come back into play. I guess the last piece there is risk, risk of eviction. And the landlord can still issue a warning for uh, rent arrears, either a 14-day or a 20-day warning. 
Um, and if the arrears are not paid in that time frame, the landlord uh, will be in a position to issue a notice of termination when the moratorium expires. You take maybe, a, this is a, an example of say a two parent family living in Dublin 15, paying 1800 for a three bed house and they've missed one month's rent. Uh, both pay, parents are now on the pandemic unemployment payment of 700 euro a week and receiving rent supplement. So for them to pay 1800 uh, rent in two weeks is, in, is effectively impossible um, unless they've very substantial kind of savings and in four weeks it's highly unlikely so they will manage it they may manage it over time but this does not guarantee that they will be able to uh, hold on to their their home so i'm just conscious of your time and the need for for q a so just very briefly some solutions obviously measures needed to support tenants with the arrears they already have accumulated to prevent further arrears from accumulating and to ensure they will, they will not be evicted for rent arrears once the moratorium ends, whenever that end is, whether it's the end of June or, or whether that's extended. So in the medium and long term, rents need to reduce somehow uh, to more affordable levels. Some options include an extension on the moratorium. Um, that isn't a, you know, a structural solution, but it does uh, buy some time. Um, and then secondly, a revision in the manner in which landlords can evict tenants for rent arrears to avoid a wave of tenants without a home in a period after, say, the 28 days notice. Um, I guess thirdly, to provide some kind of suite of measures for tenants to resolve rent arrears, you know, maybe formalise repayment plans, um, enhance financial supports, uh, maybe a loan system, debt forgiveness. Um, I suppose a lot will, will hinge on the ability to um, negotiate rent down, rents downwards, either between landlords or tenants or landlords, threshold and tenants or, or other players. Um, and obviously the provision of social housing will, will have a, a bearing there, but obviously we can't wait for that. That's a longer term process. So I just want, at this stage we'll pause and ask if people have any questions for any 